We had zero based budgeting. That came mm -hmm. in under the thrust finance minister of the PLP government, but this is a further refinement. As you look at the tension in doing budgets, and even if you recall that whenever you see trimming of expenditure in various um, departments, what you want to make sure as is that you look at it over a multi-year um, process, not just for capital accounts, um, but also for current accounts. Because what you're seeking to do is, at the same time, you know that you have only a fixed amount of, of um, resources that are available, besides those that are being expended on salary costs. And really, in terms of, as you look at the programs, it's very, very rigid in many cases. So I think in order to give departments a little more flexibility as they look across at a spectrum of three to four years, as opposed to just one year, it makes it more plausible. For instance, I won't cite the ministry, but one ministry when we had the introduction of the budget in February, they would not have been able to effect the savings until probably later on in the year, in the second half of the year, because of the nature of the contracts and things that needed to be dealt with even on the personnel levels. So you've got to make sure that what you want to do, the, the easy way is to say that at a time of economic hardship, you want to provide as much um, help as you can. But you have to, it's like seeing in the days of Greek mythology, it's the two-headed sort of monster and going in opposite directions. You, on the one hand, you want to assist people who need help and assist those who, who fall within the need for welfare. But on the other hand, you've also got to be conscious at the macro level and the country level and in terms of being, continuing to be attractive as a jurisdiction, that you maintain your, your ratings and also that you're not seen to be spending. And even though, and you'll see it when you go down, because we couldn't, um, even in the house, I didn't table it, because it's like an 80-page document and to make the copies. But when you look, you'll see some of the pictures. Even though you'll see that in terms of the current government, um, general government debt, even though you see Bermuda <coughs> low, that's nothing to be to be excited about because other jurisdictions have a higher um, debt to GDP ratio. We want to stay low and want to get even lower, but I, this is provided for comparative purposes. However, if you were to look at the Bermuda government debt in US um, versus general government debt, you'll see certain, um, certain statistics and you'll certainly see that our debt levels have increased. And our levels have increased because we're seeking to provide more assistance. But what we're saying to you, and what I think is the most interesting aspect, we haven't floated all the ideas, because, and some are being formulated now, but what we're seeking to get input on, for instance, and is when you look at gaming um, revenue and the gaming tax. It's at about 18% now. If you speak to some of the entrepreneurs where we do have the betting tax as opposed to gaming tax, they'll say that there is the opportunity to generate more revenue if the tax was tur turned down somewhat. If you look at even means testing, we have tried to be egalitarian when we give a benefit, which is to help people, let's say in terms of land tax, you tend to give, the, uh, give it across the board to seniors, where some may be able to afford it more than others. So you're introducing, while from a government point of view, it's nice and less complicated to go across the board. In a time where you are seeking to eke out more revenue, and since you know that your expenditure um, side is less, is less flexible, you want to make sure that you are properly deploying the resources you have to those who need it most. So you'll have heard, and in terms of in the throne speech, about legislation with regard to the contributory pension fund. You've heard, you would have heard legislation about the PSSF and how maybe we should provide some of the same benefits we provide on the public side, sector pension pensions on the private sector pensions, also the public um, sector. But you may also have heard about the non-contributory pension and the means testing, because you want to make sure that the monies are going where the people need it. If Mr. Box is um, 
is somebody who is well healed and doesn't need the help, then perhaps what you need to do is move it from this box over to here, Miss Fox, who may have a greater need. So I think what you have is you're floating a number of options in this pre-budget report, and it's part of a compendium. There are other aspects too, and I said, spoke to this in the ministerial statement, that are gonna come as part of the open budget process. And one of the motivations is this. Budgeting is like around January, when people are feeling in the doldrums after spending in Christmas. The next thing they worry about, and they see this whole expanse of time, no holidays coming maybe till Easter, and they, they feel depressed. And then they start to fantasize and have nightmares about what the budget is going to have. What does it mean? People speculate. Usually they get it wrong, but they speculate. What this is seeking to do is to take the mystery out, to let people know that how money is spent is something which is not um, covert or secretive, and that part of how money is spent is something that they also should have input in. So what happens on February the 20th or whatever day the budget is, when people speculate and then they look at what the budget decisions are, instead of talking about, okay, this charity has gotten less, that charity has gotten less, this hasn't been given to sports, that hasn't been given to sports, you're part of the process doesn't mean that, that you will decide ultimately, but I, the, it's good to get people talking because if you want to give more here, then you have to realize that it isn't a manna falling from heaven. It's your taxpayers' dollars and the policy decisions which will underpin the budget decisions are really about what are the priorities. What are the priorities? And it's... Leading on from that and going off your, I haven't read the pre budget report yet, but I have read your ministerial statement, I've gone through it quickly. Mm -hmm. You say towards the end of it that spending is at next year's level, or, we, or spending is frozen at next year's level for the next four fiscal years. <coughs> and in line with your multi year budgeting process, mm -hmm. but that seems to fall into line. I note also that in the, your ministerial statement, you make the point, or you give the figures that say that 60% of the government's revenue. Mm -hmm is committed to government uh, employee costs. And that seems to be one of those fixed costs. It isn't going to go away unless something fairly drastic is done about that. Given that the fixed costs of personnel costs and the rising debt service costs are still there, and you allude to that in the ministerial mm -hmm. statement, mm -hmm. and that the revenue is clearly mm -hmm. volatile, mm -hmm. having projected 1.058 million last year, mm -hmm. reaching 991 million Mm -hmm. in that year, looking at hopefully getting 9, 30 million to say this year. <coughs> How long do you see that this process of maintaining government spending, especially on personnel, will continue? I think the challenge and the opportunity is, for instance, when you look at something like the, um, you made a, had a commentary last week and Minister Minas responded in terms of talking about the Postal Service Review. If you were to look at the review, it would suggest that we have more people than needed at this time. But at the same time, what we have done is freeze um, non-essential, freeze non-essential hirings. There are areas where there is a need for personnel, maybe less pressing but still in important areas, and I probably should say less urgent but still in important areas. The issue is that even though you've frozen new hires, there is the opportunity as part of the rationalization of how we use our resources and our personnel resources to use it more efficiently. And it may be that though you are not um, ha taking on new hires, you may be able to use some of those staff who are in other areas in terms of and be deploying them. For instance, let's say arbitrarily there is a need for, in this economic downturn in particular, to look at having more in immigration inspectors or someone to help the immigration inspectorate. Look at, for instance, what has happened recently with the rationalization of the One Stop Career Center and the National Training Board and the Labor Department. 
tremendous amount of money has been saved, but it's been saved by looking at how we have to stop operating in silos and rationalize how we, we allocate the people. And it's by, by looking at it through that prism that you've seen that there have been monies being able to be saved as opposed to using to hire, get spending more money and also taking on people. Even in a ministry that I'm very close to as finance, as we look at the procurement unit, if we were to have in an ideal world what we need so that unit can do its job to the best of its ability, initial um, indications looking at it, the normal way we look at um, staffing and staffing up would have seen us spend an additional amount of a million dollars. That to me is untenable, especially as the minister who sits around this table who's seeking to um, pull and the reins on additional spending on personnel. So what we did was look at it with a fresh prism and, uh, and look at it and see what did we have in terms of consultancies that were expiring at the end of the year. What about some of the people who are able to provide that sort of thought? Um, they're able to follow direction and also benefit in terms of having somebody who is at a senior level be able to direct them. And so you can also look at understaffing in terms of the position is, is not necessarily at the senior level, but you this is an opportunity to use some of your graduates. So I think what we've sought to do, and it's a hard one to be quite honest, and you'll see that the ministerial statement and when you look at the pre-budget report, it is this recognition that there is some rigidity in terms of how we do, when you look at the expenditure side and the fact that there are some necessary expenditures, you don't want to just turn off the tap in terms of the, the allowances and concessions, particularly where they are for people from a social policy perspective who need help. And you'll see where we've even in terms of exceeded expenditure, some of the things in terms of the child daycare. At this time, people need help, but we do have to look at how we can do it better. And I say site as just a, a small example is, um, for instance, looking at the quarry and gas. Government is one government, but different ministries sometimes have different um, procurement practices. We're changing that, but we've been able to effect some efficiency by all those who are going to get gas at one central point. It seems simplistic, it seems commonsensical, but it wasn't always happening. So you've been able to save monies. Um, you've, there, are, there are many areas where, in fact, the, um, what, what would I say, you know when we put out the call within the public sector for views as to efficiency savings, a number of those calls and, and, and the efficiency savings we are introducing and weaving in at this time. So we talk about efficiency savings as, as helping to give us fiscal space, as well as the multi-year budgeting. And we have had um, three ministries are being are now piloting, but it obviously has to go across government. And ministries are fine because you'll find ministers are, are getting excited because it's a layer on top of the ZBB, zero-based budgeting. And you can't, much as I, I mean, I, I'd be stupid, much as I, I'd like to be able to hold ministers totally to the fire, I have to appreciate that for me to tell the Minister of Health at a time when there is a need in terms of the senior subsidy and, and health care costs for seniors, you can't take a, a one-size-fits-all approach with every ministry. Some ministries are going to have more um, flexibility to give and some will not be able to give. Some there will be with some ministries you can cut, not unless you're about to say that you're going to have um you're not you're just not going to do your job of of governing, and you you have to be be mindful of that.